طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آه السلام عليكم يا جماعة يعطيكم العافية آه انا نزلت عندكم على الجروب كيس للدسكشن للانترودكتوري كورس آه بما انه عندكم صعوبة بال بالكيسات ويعني في تبديل كتير بالجروبات ولسه ما بعرف اذا في فرص كتير لتناقشوا الكيسات فقلت لحالي نزل كيس تكون مثل خلينا نقول تمبليت او بروتوتايب تحاولوا منه تتعلموا مشان يعني اذا ما الى الان كتبتوا هيستوري كامله وعرفتوا شلون بدي انكتب ان شاء الله هي تساعدكم هلا هي الهيستوري كتبتها لما كنت انا بسنه رابعه as you can see here Uh, MIP Dietics Rotation سنة رابعة يعني halfway through ف don't think it's impossible يعني إن شاء الله you can do it خلال شهرين ثلاثة بعد introductory course إذا شديتوا حالكم إن شاء الله uh, بس تبلشوا أول ميجر حتكون الهستري تبعكم أحسن بكتير طيب anyways um, هي واحد اثنين abdominal pain case فطبعا ال patient privacy any information إلى علاقة صار عليها مسح فنبلش بالكيس طبعا الكيس اوريدي موجوده ونزلت على جروبكم بس قلت لحالي سجل فيديو للشغلات المهمه في بعض التعقيبات على الكتابات طبعا انا كتبت بسنه رابعه في شويه نقوصة يعني نواقص فقلت لحالي اعلق عليها ويعني مشان ان شاء الله تستفيدوا من الكيس هي طيب بسم الله آه هي بلال دروبي واسم الجروب والاي دي فالبيشنت بروفايل اتس ذا فيرست بارت اوف ذا هيستوري يو شود نو هو يور بيشنت از اوكي فلما نجي لهون this is the name I took his social number حتى فا يعني to be يعني completely uh, covering everything كان عمره 12 سنة اوكي okay, uh, خلينا نحكي بالانجليزي احسن so we'll be talking the history we'll be discussing the history in English because our education is supposed to be in English uh, and we should also improve our English language uh, so not just medicine so anyways he's a 12 year old male in his 7th grade He lives in our city, and he was admitted to, I scratched out the hospital's name, but anyways, he was admitted to the ER, and we were there, by the way, uh, at 12 a.m. in Wednesday, 2018. So we were there, 11 in the morning, taking the history from him in the ER. Uh, of course, the patient was there, he did not come alone, he came with his parents, uh, and we were talking to them at 12 p.m., so... 11 a.m. he came and we were talking to them at 12 p.m. so that's a one hour uh, delay okay so now the chief complaint I will try to be as brief as possible you can read it on your own but I want to cover the main things I don't want this session to be too long uh, so the chief complaint uh, of course it is the description of the, the reason that the patient came he may have other problems that's not our concern we care about what was the reason that made him come to the ER and you should also add for how many hours or days uh, of duration did he have that so fever and abdominal pain it can be two things but try not to go over that because then it would be too long so he came the two main problems he came with fever and abdominal pain for one day duration one day prior to admission prior to coming to the uh, to the emergency department Okay, so that's clear. So today we're talking uh, to him at uh, afternoon or at noon, exactly. And he, uh, all this problem started yesterday. So he says now, of course, I hit the name. Let's call him Ahmed. So Ahmed, this is how you start your history. HPI, the history of pres present illness. Ahmed, a 12-year-old previously healthy male complained of. Now we said previously healthy because he did not have any prior illnesses. If he did have any chronic illness, let's say diabetes, we would definitely put it here in the uh, in the first part of the history of present illness because it will be very very important in our differentials and we will discuss this um, towards the end of, these, uh, of the history. So a previously healthy male, he has no chronic illnesses, complained of nausea since uh, morning one day ago. So yesterday in the morning the problem started. At 5 p.m. the same day he developed fever Periambilical pain, uh, periambilical abdominal pain, uh, and diarrhea, low appetite and fatigue. Uh, there should be a comma here. But anyways, so he has many problems. As you can see, those are all symptoms he had, but we only put the chief complaint, the two, the one or two most important things at the top. 
okay those are the associated symptoms as well fever vague abdominal pain and diarrhea he also had low appetite he did not eat much and fatigue okay so now we should early on in the history of present illness we should discuss the socrates okay the details of of the chief complaints here so fever abdominal pain we should expand more upon them in the history of present illness so fever we should now here talk about it of course the punctuation is not really perfect uh but anyways we are here now to discuss medicine um so fever was documented you should talk about if it was measured at home or not or if it was just by tactile measurement because those two have different uh reliabilities anyway so it was documented orally in a thermometer in his mouth at home it was 38.5 celsius so that's that's high fever of course usually we consider it a fever uh, if it's above 30 37.5 so his abdominal pain in the periambilical area uh, area developed at the same time so right out the time he had the fever the onset was sudden abdomen was tender um this is a sm an actual error i should not put it here uh this is about the physical examination tender means it's painful to touch now pain is simply uh discomfort in that area but tenderness it's pain with uh touch and pressure so this should actually ha have been uh, put at the end in the physical examination let's continue the pain was sharp and constant so if you remember the socrates uh sight this is the first most important thing when someone says i have pain you should ask him where is the pain sight onset character r is for radiation a associated uh, symptoms the exacerbating and relieving factors and severity so let's see how many of the socrates did we mention here so onset was sudden and the duration, uh, the site is, we said periambilical here. Onset, character is uh, sharp and constant. And radiation, it radiated to the, to the back and flanks, which are the, uh, if you remember the four regions, right? It's from the two sides near the lumbar area. So from the hypochondriac down to the, to the lumbar area. And this is important and we will also discuss why. So it radiated from the periambilical also to the back and flanks, mainly on the right. Now, the only thing that we missed here so far is severity. Um, so, of course, this history is not perfect. Um, so, the severity, you can rank severity in three ways. Please memorize them all. The number one, which is the most obvious and easily accessible for adults, and you, uh, you can use it for them easily, is the scale from 0 to 10. You tell your patient, uh, well, 0 is no pain at all, the best feeling, and 10 is the worst pain you've ever felt in your life. So from 0 to 10, how painful uh, is it? And if he says, let's say, 7. So that's moderate, right? Uh, so that's, that's one type of, uh, of a method that you can use. Um, of course, this is not very practical for very young children. He's 12 years old, so it can be used for him. The second way is to assess sleep. Did he sleep or not? If he did not sleep, you can easily guess that uh, the pain was too severe for him to have any nighttime sleep because he was too worried about his pain. And the uh, third way is to assess function. So you ask the parents or you ask the person himself. Uh, in this case of this child, we are talking about pediatrics. So did he do his uh, homework, let's say, at home? Is he going? Uh, did he not go to school? Uh, is he playing with his friends? Is he having normal activity at home? Or is he just sitting in bed and suffering? Uh, so that's, you know, loss of function. If the pain is inhibiting his regular or preventing his regular activity, then it is severe. Um, so yeah, we've missed severity, so please keep that in mind. Now let's move on to diarrhea. We said diarrhea was watery, so there is no blood in stool. With a bad smell, foul smelling, six times that day. So yeah, you should mention how many times, uh, if it's loose or not, and how many times uh, per day or how many times per hour, depends on how they report it. 
non bloody not painful so he has no pain when he defecates he was given acetaminophen and this is the dose acetaminophen is the same as paracetamol now in jordan there are many generic trade names please you're not really you don't have to memorize those but it's it's really good for you for your own information even if it's not on the exam uh, don't just think is this on the exam or not you know you should know the basic drugs so paracetamol acetaminophen they are the same generic names trade names include panda uh, panadol uh, adol okay so 500 milligrams po means orally okay uh, per ostium per os and improved okay so he got acetaminophen and it, it made him feel a little bit better so until so 10 p.m that's yesterday 10 p.m that night so it started in the morning now we have reached the end of the day at 10 p.m yesterday fever increased to 40 celsius he received from his mother of course diclofenac okay this is an NSAID non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug uh, a generic name for this is uh, diclogesic okay here in jordan diclogesic so it's just changing a part of the name or voltarine uh, okay pr per rectum so instead of mouth it's from the other way around he also got a second dose of acetaminophen okay 500 milligrams again ampicillin so now they're giving uh, all our antibiotics at home as well and those are the doses so keep that in mind if you can get the doses please do report them now after giving him this his mother me uh, measured the temperature and it returned to 37 degrees celsius and the patient slept okay so it improved a little bit the fever was reduced his symptoms improved a little bit and he slept from around 10 o'clock until 2 a.m and then he woke up and vomited and this is very important and we will mention why by the way like we already told you during the orientation and if you did not know this then we are repeating this again this introductory course is not to teach you how to reach a diagnosis is not to make you a master of pediatrics or internal medicine or surgery it is about enabling you to learn the features of diseases what to ask and how to report them and write them uh, in order to be able to talk to your colleagues in medicine about such findings okay so don't worry about the diagnosis just yet so he wake up he woke up and vomited and the vomit was non-bloody and non-projectile non-bloody that's obvious no need to explain it non-projectile meaning it did not go a very long distance and sometimes this is at least classically used for describing some uh, diseases i will not there is no need to mention this in detail okay anyway so he was thirsty and he drank a lot of water he slept until 5 a.m. So, yeah, he woke up at 2 a.m. He wo uh, vomited, drank water, and then slept back until 5 in the morning. And then he woke up with chills. Okay? Um, the temperature was not measured. Please, by the way, uh, study those terms. Chills, rigors, and the differences between them. The temperature was not measured back then. Anyways, no sweating was reported acetaminophen again and ampicillin were given similar to the previously reported doses he rested until seven in the morning and then was taken to the to a healthcare clinic okay an independent one and the general practitioner there said that he should go to the er because he suspected acute appendicitis so and so yeah this is 9 a.m so now he went to that hospital in the emergency department and we saw him around uh, 11 to 12 uh, p.m. like we mentioned here. Okay, so we have covered the events from the beginning, from yesterday in the morning until the minute that he put his foot into the emergency department. So please remember to go with your uh, history in the correct sequence. Do not start by jumping randomly from here to there if you are going to your professor and let's say you have a problem with the attendance right you missed let's say a lecture and attendance was taken and you could lose a uh, some some marks let's say for you know not attending that lecture you would not just go to him and say uh well doctor 
um, I was in Amman and I was uh, visiting my family or I had an emergency and uh, so yeah you should remove it and uh, no you should explain to him hello doctor I am a fourth year medical student and you had a lecture on Sunday about uh, pediatric acute presentations and I missed it and here is my excuse okay so you give him a reference the one who you, who you were talking to doesn't know what happened in the beginning he doesn't even know who you are so the same thing to the patient you should explain the patient here tell your listener who the patient is and then explain it from the beginning as briefly as possible while not missing any important details okay so he was referred because the general practitioner was uh, concerned for acute appendicitis when he arrived uh, he was given a bolus a bolus means uh, mm, um, there is a way to calculate it, but in generally, it's a propos it's a, it's a certain volume of fluids that's given IV, okay, in the acutely ill patient. So he was given normal saline with a con concentration of 0 0.9. This is normal saline, okay, uh, because he was feeling ill, and we will explain why soon. So he was given a bolus instantly and a urine sample was collected. His urine was dark yellow. This is scratched out. I don't want to discuss it in much detail. Um, anyways, let's move on. Because mainly we want, I don't want to explain everything right now. Our concern is not the diagnosis, but to give you the structure. So anyways, going back to our patient. Now on, on, Looking at him, he had tachypnea. Ah, oh, uh, this is history, still. Now, we have mentioned the history of present illness. And if, by the way, if you notice, we have mentioned the Socrates here. And we have mentioned nausea and diarrhea and vomiting. So these are all from the checklist of the systematic review from the GI system. We have put it at the top because it's important to our patient. He's compli uh, complaining of GI pain. Therefore, we will put that part in the history of present illness. Okay. So, tachypnea palpitations, cold extremities, and dry mouth were reported. Also, this is why uh, he was given uh, a bolus, uh, uh, IV fluids, because he was breathing fast, tachypnea, palpitations, right? And his heart rate was, was uh, fast, as you will see. So this is why he was given a bolus. He was dehydrated, that's the point. Those are signs of dehydration. Cold extremities, dry mouth, palpitations, uh, because it's uh, tachycardia, right? His heart rate was high, and tachypnea. So he was given a bolus. The patient developed a headache, periorbital, around the eyes, and bilateral, and blurry vision shortly to receiving saline in the ER. After this, after the bolus, uh, it's resolved, okay? 500 cc means uh, milligrams, milliliters. So it's the same. Now, <laughs> here's an interesting part. A further questioning, we are still in the history of present illness, by the way. Uh, the family said, the parents said that fish was eaten one day ago. So not yesterday, but the day before. They ate fish that day uh, while visiting their relatives. But no similar complaint in the family or siblings. So they thought it could be poisoning. Uh, so that's why why they reported it. But we asked them, and they said no, uh, no one else had uh, similar symptoms. No one in the family or siblings. But a five-year-old brother claimed he he had abdominal pain, only for a short while, and then he stopped. Pain, uh, but no other symptoms. Parents believed it was to get attention. He had no, nothing else. He just pointed to his abdomen and said, "I have pain," and then he stopped. So they left him at the, at home. They didn't even bring him. But anyways, you should note it, right? You should never forget any important details. You, you never know uh, what is the truth until you investigate it further. Now, in closing the history of present illness, we are about to end this important portion. Know now the, the quick checklist. Now you bring the negatives and positives, the pertinent or the rel uh, relevant positives or negatives. You put them uh, in the history of present illness at the end so we say no history of similar complaints he did not have such a problem before this is important and trust me like you may think this is very confusing i can like how, how can this be helpful 
But when you study each disease that causes abdominal pain, you will know that each word we, we put here helps us rule out or at least decrease the probability of a certain uh, diagnosis. Inshallah, you will learn this as you progress in your majors, whether you are talking about internal medicine, surgery, or pediatrics. Um, okay, so he did not have any uh, such problem before. As we said, if we go back here, if you remember, he was previously healthy. Okay, so the same thing here. No such similar complaint before. No history of trauma. He did not get punched in the stomach or anything like that. This is important because let's say he was kicked in the stomach. Right? This can be called, this can cause, let's say, pancreatitis. Or whatever, any organ damage. So no history of trauma, no recent travel, weight loss unknown. This is important. They did not measure uh, his weight in the hospital, unfortunately. He, they did not have a measuring device, I think. Uh, this is very, 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 very important. Jaundice. So if you remember that, please open your GI checklist right now and look at the GI checklist, you have, imagine the GI as one tube, right? The mouth at the top and the anus at the bottom. Let's start from the uh, uh, top. Uh, appetite, so the opposite of having a good appetite is anorexia. Anorexia, nausea, vomiting, mouth ulcers, even though they are not so relevant right now. Uh, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, with its uh, details, diarrhea, constipation, um, and jaundice. Jaundice is extremely important. Of course, in vomiting and diarrhea, you should also ask if there is uh, blood. This is very important. But jaundice now, why? Because the liver is in the abdomen, in the right upper quadrant. And liver pathology can cause uh, abdominal pain, right? And it can cause jaundice at the same time. For example, if he has um, stones, gold stones, right? This can cause jaundice or hepatitis, hepatitis A. Maybe it's acute hepatitis. So who knows? It can present with acute abdominal pain, fever, vomiting, right? And jaundice. So now when you start mentioning what's there and not there, it helps us to narrow down our differential diagnosis. In an ideal world, of course, you, you can order an MRI and a CT scan and all the imaging and laboratory studies for everyone. But in reality, you can do this. You have to ask questions. And according to the signs, symptoms, and physical examination, you decide what test to order to save time and uh, resources. So he has no jaundice, no mouth ulcers, no ill contacts, right so no one with similar symptoms no coriza, uh, coriza or short coriza means uh, common cold so no common cold symptoms or no shortness of breath okay why are we mentioning uh, common cold and shortness of breath because common cold or influenza let's talk more about influenza by the way guys this is a very very important distinction and unfortunately Many of us do not learn to distinguish between them. Uh, we think that a common cold is the same as the influenza. And this is a big mistake. The influenza is similar to the COVID right now. A little bit better uh, in the mortality rate and such. But it's really severe. It's, it comes with, uh, with fever, uh, fatigue, myalgia, generalized symptoms. It can also come with abdominal pain and diarrhea and, and nausea and vomiting. Well, a common cold is just your, uh, you know, some sneezing and nasal discharge. So please distinguish between them. Uh, so if he has influenza, this can also present with abdominal pain, even though it's uh, not very, very common. So I mean, anyways, also no dysuria. Why are we mentioning dysuria? Because... Again, we are now talking about the pertinent or relevant positives or negatives. By saying that we have no uh, pain upon urination, we are now decreasing our probability or the consideration of a urinary tract infection. So if he has a painful urination, then we can think it is a urinary tract infection, which can be localized to the 
lower urinary tract in the bladder or it can even ascend upwards and go to the uh, kidneys and this is much more dangerous so by mentioning this this is very very important so as you can see those are the pertinent positives or negatives now this is for example not about the GI this is not from the GI this is from the respiratory this is from the urinary symptom uh, system but they are relevant to the abdominal pain presentation no urinary urgency or frequency okay because also not just painful urination but needing to go urgently suddenly to the bathroom or needing to go to go frequently to the bathroom also are uh, symptoms of uh, a urinary tract infection no altered mental status so he was oriented when we were talking to him even though he was really sick he has no drugs previously used other than the listed above okay this is also important but i'm not sure if you remember from your basic years please think back to the to the um, endocrino, uh, endocrinology endocrine system what is the drug that if you stop it suddenly you can have a problem think about it for a second there are some medications that you cannot stop suddenly and if you do it can cause a big problem one of them is uh, corticosteroids one of them are corticosteroids okay for example if he was an asthmatic he had asthma this is just a hypothetical scenario this is just to give you the idea why do we ask these questions why do we put them in the history let's say another patient he has asthma and it is really severe so he it's been a while and he's been on uh, um, corticosteroids prednisone let's say orally for a while for let's say two months just trying to uh, decrease the severity of his uh, exacerbations okay and suddenly he stopped his medications for any reason uh, uh, any reason or another this can present with such symptoms we call it a um, an adrenal crisis right because his body got so used to the prednisolone or the corticosteroids for a while and his adrenal cortex if you remember we have the adrenal cortex above the kidneys right the, the adrenal gland as a whole and we have a cortex and a medulla the cortex has three parts zona glomerulosa fasciculata reticularis reticularis the fasciculata is the largest one the largest uh, part and it produces glucocorticoids but if you take uh, external sources uh, uh, external sources of glucocorticoids for a while it causes suppression now we should not go back to the physiology i'm sure you know it better than me because uh, you only studied it recently but so it causes negative feedback right and it causes inhibition of ACTH secretion and so that the final outcome the point is the adrenal uh, this part of the adrenal cortex the zona fasciculata atrophies because it's no longer needed we are receiving exogenous corticosteroids so if you stop it suddenly you, you are not taking your own medications and neither is your body producing its own uh, supply of corticosteroids so we have a, a, an adrenal crisis and this can present with altered mental status hypotension hypoglycemia and abdominal pain okay so please keep this in mind so we have said no drugs previously used he did not use anything other than the listed before so this is the history of present illness we talked about this okay how did the symptoms progress and what are the relevant positives and negatives so now let's go over the systematic uh, the systemic review quickly this is the rest of the checklist that's not as relevant to his presentation as the previously mentioned symptoms so the general he has fatigue right fever fatigue uh, weight loss the B symptoms right those are all considered general things that are not very specific to any type of disease 
but they are a very important indicator to the state of the patient as a whole. So he is fatigued, he has sleep disturbance, yes, so this is a positive. He has low appetite, current weight was not measured, cardiovascular, he has none. Uh, respiratory, nothing. Musculoskeletal, nothing. So I will not be spending time on this. Your time is very valuable. And I don't want this video to be too long. The nervous system, this is the only thing that was uh, concerning. A headache, he reported a headache, but it went away after uh, his uh, saline. So that's a good thing. And it did not return, by the way. He did not have any seizures, no loss of consciousness, no confusion. The endocrine system, he did not have sweating, cold, or heat intolerance. No bleeding. His psychological state was fine. Now, the drug history. He has no other drugs than the previously mentioned. Uh, the last vaccine was taken at so on and so forth. Okay, so he's, he's, he's not so young, so the vaccines are not really that relevant, but we mentioned them anyways to cover everything as an example of a full history. His past medical history, you can see that it's very important to say, did he have any prior admissions? Was he acutely sick for any reason? So it says he has no prior hospitalizations, no prior surgeries in his abdomen. And if he has surgeries, then you should specify what type of surgery and for what was the reason that he had it. He has no other illnesses. The family history, no history of premature death. No chronic illnesses, no inherited disorders in the family, and the, there is no consangu consanguinity, which is marriage of re related uh, uh, marriage of relatives. Okay, so there is no consanguinity as well, and this is also important because in Jordan uh, we have a very interesting disease that can cause abdominal pain, and it is more prevalent in, uh, in consanguinous marriages. And I'm pretty sure the vast majority of you have not heard this uh, of, of this disease before at least fourth year. Neither did I. I did not know this disease before my fourth year. Uh, so yeah, it was very interesting to learn about because our books are from the from the West, right? It's from the uh, American and British uh, writers. And that disease is, is it's a very very rare disease to them. It's like a zebra, uh, but to us it's very very common. It's around 1 in 2,000 or so. And this is an estimation. We don't really know the exact prevalence in Jordan, but it's from the nearing countries, from the neighboring countries. Anyways, the maternal and neonatal history, we have mentioned here some, you know, some details about when he was born, if he was healthy at birth, what was his weight. Um, that was a very long time ago. That's 12 years ago. He's now, he, he's now a teenager. So I will be skipping this, but you can read it on your own. The social history, he lives in Erbit, he owns his house, one floor, he has animal contact, but nothing really uh, in this week. There is really nothing uh, so helpful here. So, now coming to the physical examination. Now, we start with the general examination. And the general is very important, by the way, just by looking for a second on the patient, we can, like, humans are amazing at detecting so many things at once, right? Better than machines, at least, in, in many scenarios, at least right now. Uh, so, the general examination is important. So, we say, the patient was, is resting in seated position and receiving saline IV. He is not confused, not in distress. He improved, by the way, when he was given that. No cyanosis, no visible scars or skin lesions on his abdomen okay the vitals are vital you should never never forget to mention them the heart rate was 152 and this is elevated right so you'd expect it to be in the range of between 60 and 100 right he's a teenager maybe it can be a little bit higher um, what uh, what is the reason for the heart rate elevation uh, there can be many reasons but the obvious one at least is fever Fever increases the heart rate. Okay, so his heart rate is elevated. He's also also breathing rapidly because uh, the expected normal range for breathing is from 12 to 16, right? More than that is, is is concerning. So he has some, you know, sometimes it mentions more than 20, so 12 to 20. 
So anyway, it's it's really too high. It's 28. And this is also from uh, from his illness, from the fever, from the dehydration. Anyway, we should not discuss any further because um, right now we are concerned with the history and not the diagnosis. Even though we'll be touching uh, upon the diagnosis briefly. His blood pressure was normal, so that's good. Oxygen, oxygen is also good. The extremities are cold and the capillary, there should be a comma here, capillary filling time is 4 seconds. So the capillary filling should be 2 or less, 2 seconds or less. So it was 4. And you will learn on the physical examination, uh, please Google or, or look, look at YouTube how to, uh, to measure the capillary reflux. Okay, no clubbing, no lymphadenopathy in the head or neck, no jaundice and sclera again. So, yeah, here, by the way, yeah, uh, we mentioned jaundice twice, if you remember. Here is in the, here it is in the history of present illness. So, is this inappropriate repetition? Well, here we are talking about what the family said. So, we asked them, did you notice any yellow discoloration in your son? If they said no, then this is from their report. But when I examined him myself, and of course you examine for jaundice and the, and the sclera, so you pull the eyelid down or the above the, the upper eyelid up, and you see if there is uh, jaundice, yellowness, and this is on physical examination. So those are two separate things, the report and the physical. They may say, no, we did not notice any yellowness, but you may notice it on physical examination. So, there is no conjunctival pallor, mucous membranes are dry, because he was dehydrated. His weight um, was 42 kilograms in the 50th centile. That's his self-report. That's from what he knows from uh, his, his prior measurements. The centiles, is, in pediatrics you will learn more about this, there are charts. Uh, it will take a long time for me to show you one. But it's a growth chart. You can just Google a growth chart and see. Uh, all the ages, you know, they have uh, different growth rates and some people are taller or heavier than others, so there's a range from, uh, and you can measure and find the centile. So he is at 50th centile, so he's, he's normal. And the height is so and so. So, upon a, um, now, the rest of the sy systems, this is the cardiovascular, this is the respiratory, I will not be mentioning them, please read them on your own. Uh, and watch the videos. It's very, very important. It's much important, much more important to see the videos than listen to me talk. But I will only mention the GI because that's what's relevant to us right now. The GI, mm, by the way, perhaps the GI should have been put at the uh, at the top because it's most relevant. Uh, but in our hospital form, right, uh, what we're used to is you know that checklist. So, usually the cardiovascular and respiratory come first. Anyways, flat and symmetrical abdomen. So, now we are expecting. We did not put our hands on the patient yet. So, we say his abdomen is flat, symmetrical on both sides. The umbilicus, which is the belly button, it's inverted. If it was protruding outward, we would say it's everted or protruding. And this is important. Uh, those are all things that you should notice and they can be helpful in the diagnosis. There is no hair on the abdomen, normal for his age of course. No scars, this is extremely important. If he had any prior scar, you should mention it. It can be a midline scar, a, a, a large midline one. And this can, you know, uh, this is laparotomy. It can be one in the uh, right upper quadrant, in the hypochondriac area. And and this is, you know, this indicates a cholecystectomy. If you find three small scars on near the umbilicus and one near the upper quadrant, maybe, three different scars, maybe one at the bottom, this is a, a, laparoscopic, a, a laparoscopic procedure. So, you know, uh, so you have different... You can just Google it. You have different uh, cuts. So from one place they insert the camera. From one place they insert the uh, the tools to inflate the abdomen with gas so they can see. 
and from one area they insert you know their uh, clips and tools that they would use to do the surgery so please learn the different types of scars and what they indi indicate what type of surgery did he have and uh, what else if you find now for example an append appendectomy it can be done using the open method or it can be done with the laparoscope so the laparoscope can do a cholecystectomy remove the gallbladder it can also remove the appendix uh, if you find a, a, a scar in the right lower quadrant then it's most likely uh, an appendectomy right he removed his appendix there are different surgical methods different surgeons prefer different things but anyways please learn them these are really helpful and important there are no skin lesions no dilated vein in his abdomen if you remember uh, cirrhosis can result in uh, portal hypertension and you can have dilated veins in the abdomen so this is important to mention there are no spider nevi this is again a sign of liver disease no jaundice again no ulcers in the mouth no hernia in the periumbilical area uh, in the uh, periumbilical area so it, he can have a periumbilical hernia and he can have a, an inguinal hernia so you should expose the patient and examine that area and make sure that uh, there is no protrusion Aud audible abdominal sounds so uh, what else no clubbing please if you look at MacLeod in the third chapter yeah, in the third chapter. There is a table. Just to save you the effort. This is a very, very, one of the most important tables in MacLeod. You should memorize it just like you memorize your name. Uh, chapter 3. Chapter 3. Page 3 the table is number 3.5 okay it's right here causes of clubbing so please memorize this very very well it can be from a respiratory uh, pathology from a cardiovascular pathology from a GI pathology or endocrine uh, yeah so you should know the causes of clubbing and liver cirrhosis can cause clubbing um, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, can also cause clubbing. So this is relevant. Uh, no flapping tremor. This is a sign of liver disease. Liver span was 8 centimeters. And um, you can examine this by percussion and from palpation. If you can feel the liver edge. If not, then just measure it up to the area that you felt with percussion. You can find this also on YouTube. On attempting palpation and percussion, this is very, very important now. When we try to palpate and percuss his abdomen, there is severe generalized tenderness present in the whole abdominal area with guarding. So, just upon touching his abdomen, there is tenderness and pain everywhere with guarding. Guarding means uh, the, co the, the contraction of muscles because he's trying to protect his abdomen from the pressure, right? Because of the pain. There is a negative Rovzing sign. Please uh, read about it. Rovzing. It is when you, if you press on the right, uh, on the left lower quadrant, okay, on the left lower quadrant. If you press on the left lower quadrant, it causes uh, pain in the right quadrant, right lower quadrant. Again, this is the, let's look at it uh, from your side, yeah? Uh, if we have the right and the left side, the, the lower quadrant. Pressing the left lower quadrant and causing pain in the right lower quadrant, this is called a positive Rovzing sign. If, if there is no such thing, then we say it's negative. So there is a negative Rovzing sign. Percussion and deep palpation and spleen palpation was not allowed because of the patient's severe pain. We could not even get him just to allow us to even touch his abdomen barely.
because he was really in pain so we stopped right so the pain does not increase with movement hip flexion or cuff okay PR was not done so a, a, a digital rectal examination was not done and the inquiry region examination was not accepted by the patient so you should note this when a patient refuses an examination you should note it these are the examinations for the nervous system you can read them on your own now uh, we are done with the case now up to this point as an introductory course student you have done your job in the next step you if like if you want to do more than that then you are welcome so just to add a little bit of you know to to bring you context to the uh, to the case what are your differentials what can be the possible causes for his abdominal pain please you can pause the video and think about it give me five causes for his abdominal pain okay so uh so let's look at the list the differential diagnosis differential diagnoses okay Diagnosis is the plural of diagnosis. Uh, number one, the top and the most concerning one and the most likely is acute appendicitis. The second, we have ranked it. No, now, if you are asked, you can decide to rank your differentials by order of probability, which is the most likely, descending down to the least likely, or you can choose to rank them by their uh, seriousness and by the level of danger that they pose to the health of the patient okay so sometimes the most common is not the most dangerous but you know in, in our case appendicitis is really uh, one of the most dangerous and the most common and pyelonephritis as well so our differentials was acute appendicitis for obvious reasons we all know appendicitis and I mean, the GP himself, he suspected it from the beginning, and that's why he was referred to our emergency department for him to be evaluated by the surgery team. Now, what about pyelonephritis? If you remember, think about it. Pyelonephritis can cause fever, can cause flank pain, and if you remember, he had flank pain. Um, and it can cause vomiting and many of the other symptoms. But what decreases the chance of pyelonephritis in our patient is that he's previously healthy he's a male and males have uh, a much lower um, incidence of urinary tract infections than females so if he did not have any prior UTIs and he does not even now complain of any symptoms of urinary tract infections why would he have pyelonephritis? I mean it can happen but it's less likely okay but it's still important and this is why we mentioned it in the history of present illness when we said here now if we go back so hopefully now we are coming around and you are seeing the relevance of such things um, where is it yeah no dysuria no urinary urgency or frequency right but he did have flank pain and this was very very concerning yeah radiated to the back and flanks so anyways Still, it should be a differential, we should not rule it out, but it's less likely than appendicitis. And by the way, um, if you again go back, imagine yourself now, you are in the ER and you are doing or making these decisions. You see, a urine sample was collected. So we did not just say, oh, it's not going to be pyelonephritis. It's, uh, you know, he did not have urinary symptoms. No, pyelonephritis is a very, very serious uh, condition and this is why we ordered a urine sample it can help us so yeah and it's a very cheap and straightforward test um, what else okay so th these are the two most dangerous diagnoses I mean these can kill a patient acute appendicitis if it ruptures it can kill him and pyelonephritis as well it can progress to sepsis and septic shock what about gastroenteritis simple diarrhea infectious diarrhea yeah it can be the cause can gastroenteritis cause abdominal pain obviously nausea vomiting 
dehydration, fever. These can all happen in uh, gastroenteritis. But why do we put it at the bottom? Because our philosophy in the ER, please know this very well and remember it. And this is, by the way, what I talked uh, briefly in my uh, other videos, if you are interested to, ch to check them out, in the videos about uh, cognitive debiasing, is that we the steps that we use, especially in the ER, uh, is to always rose, rose, R-O-W-S, which means roll out worst case scenario. Now, the patient came to you with these symptoms. You're not going to tell him, oh, don't worry, it's just diarrhea, go home. No, you should think of the worst scenario and then rule it out and then you can consider other less dangerous diagnoses. Otherwise, you are not being a safe physician. So yeah, gastroenteritis is very, very probable. And maybe it can, the probability of acute appendicitis and gastroenteritis may be very close. But still, we will not put it at the top, especially in our thinking. Maybe you can write it if you want at the top, no problem. But when you do workup, you should always do it with the thought of appendicitis in your head. And when you talk to your colleagues in the surgery team, let's say, if you were referring your patient, you should tell him, I have this child, he's 12 years old, he has acute, severe abdominal pain, largely in his uh, 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 right lower quadrant, and I'm suspecting acute appendicitis. Please, uh, you know, proceed accordingly. Food poisoning. We remember, they mentioned that fish that they ate. But, you know, it's, it can present with, with a similar image. Uh, but we also put it at the bottom because we didn't think it was uh, as likely, especially that no one else in the family had such uh, symptoms. Finally, this is the diagnosis that I talked about that's prevalent, relatively prevalent in Jordan, uh, but not, uh, not seen really in the West, in the United States and in the UK, which is familial Mediterranean fever, FMF. It's one of my favorite diseases, along with the uh, HSP, <laughs> eruption line purpura, and uh, what else? Anyways, uh, Familia Mediterranean fever, or FMF. Yeah, you should know, by the way, it's name in Arabic, because the patients talk in Arabic. Uh, they call it Humma Bahar al-Bahar al-Abiyad al-Abiyad al-Mutawassat. Humma al-Bahar al-Abiyad al-Mutawassat. Humma fever. Mediterranean, Bahar al-Abiyad al-Mutawassat. Uh, familial عائلي. so this one is a disease I will not explain it but just briefly please read about it it's really interesting maybe not now you I'm sure you are very pressured in time but keep it in mind FMF read about it um, if you find my Anki deck for those of you who use Anki go on Anki oh Let's just do it right now. Um, um, Anki, just do this. Anki Drubi uh, uh, Drubi deck. Anki Drubi deck. Just Google this, and the first uh, result right here from Anki. Okay, this is my clinical deck. It has around a thousand cards filled with, with information, especially that's very useful to fourth year. I'm not going to talk about it. Maybe I'll make a special video for this to introduce you to the cards. But if you want to download it and just search for the word FMF and read about uh, Familia Mediterranean Fever. Also, you can go to Medscape FMF. Okay, and this is uh, where I first learned about FMF from this beautiful website and there's an app uh, on the smartphone as well you can read about it please download the app it's extremely useful and read about for me Mediterranean fever later on shortly and briefly it's an autosomal recessive disease that causes episodes of recurrent fever and abdominal pain and other symptoms joint pain and others so it can also be for me Mediterranean fever but if you remember and go back and this is why there is nothing useless in the history. Um, here, what is it? Family history, yeah. 
no history of premature death, no reported chronic oral health uh, diseases, no consanguinity. Now they have, they don't have this disease in their family, and they are not uh, close relatives. So the chance of familial Mediterranean fever drops, and this is why we have put it at the bottom for two reasons. Because out of all of these four, I think it was the uh, lowest probability of all of them. It, it was the least likely, and on top of that, it's the least dangerous. Because familial Mediterranean fever is self-limiting uh, by nature, so it comes and goes. Okay, of course it has some complications, but I will not measure, mention them uh, because I don't want to confuse you. So congratulations on finishing so far. Right now, as an introductory student, you have done your job. Now, if you want to continue briefly with me, just to discuss the differentials. So let's discuss him, uh, discuss him briefly. It's just one and a half, one and a quarter page. Our patient presented with a chief complaint of abdominal pain and so on and so forth. We did a history and physical and the respiratory causes were unlikely. And most likely it seemed to be surgical, like appendicitis or uh, pyronephritis. There are multiple signs and symptoms. Each of the four aforementioned differentials explain some of them. So all of these differentials explain some of the symptoms as you can see but the one that explains all of them is acute appendicitis and this is why it's the most likely okay uh, let's start with appendicitis why do we think it is so this is a discussion we talk about each disease and why we think it is the diagnosis um, appendicitis goes with acute onset okay so age group it happens most frequently you know in that age group in 10 to 20 years old he had diarrhea and vomiting tenderness abdominal guarding they are strong and sensitive signs but they are not specific meaning sensitive meaning uh, it's very uncommon for someone to have appendicitis but no uh, let's say tenderness in the abdomen right but Specific, not specific means, you know, there are many other illnesses that do the same thing. There are many other illnesses that also cause abdominal tenderness. Okay, so sensitivity and specificity are extremely important principles that you should spend some time exactly knowing what they are. And if you are interested, um, you can see the videos that I posted on my YouTube channel. They talk about this uh, in good detail. And also you can just Google anything, you know, just Google the keywords sensitivity, specificity, medicine, and watch the first or second video that shows up. I'm sure they will do a very good job of explaining this. But the patient was moving comfortably, and this did not affect his pain. Cuffing did not increase the pain either. The high fever of 40 Celsius is not in the typical picture, unless perforation and sepsis has already started. Um, so yeah, I mean... Fever can happen in, uh, in acute appendicitis. Usually it's not that high. But anyways, let's continue. Pyronephritis was suspected because if it's danger and medical urgency, and it also, also causes bilateral loin and flank pain, although it's unlikely to have pyronephritis with no previous urinary symptoms or complaints, and all, also we said that our patient Ahmed is previously healthy. And he has no anatomical abnormalities, so uh, it's less likely that he has a problem with his kidneys. Okay, so but it still it's, it should be excluded as to avoid any damage to his vital organs. So yeah, that's why we ordered a urine test and possibly a culture as well. Gastroenteritis is a probable one, uh, is a probable diagnosis, and its base rate incidence is high. The word base rate uh, means. Uh, the baseline probability the baseline probability out of a hundred children who are complaining of abdominal pain how many of them will have gastroenteritis imagine you have a hundred children or teenagers you don't know anything else about them you just know they said I have abdominal pain you don't know where is it or the duration or anything M most commonly it's gastroenteritis we all had it as children so this is what we mean by base rate incidence the baseline probability if you want to learn more about this please um, Wait a second. YouTube Bilal. This is the channel that I'll be uploading the, I mean, the, this video to, so you have already seen it. 
um, just to show you the video that explains this and I hope uh, you will enjoy it it's very I mean it's one of my best videos I think but even though I know that it's not extremely entertaining it's not extremely entertaining but it's one of my most uh, uh, detailed and interesting videos I think academically interesting not uh, entertainingly or comedically interesting so anyways this is the video uncertainty in medicine and base rate neglect so this video will explain what is base rate and uh, why is it important in medicine and also if you want to learn more about this you can read thinking fast and slow it's a very good book uh, what else so yeah, gastroenteritis explains diarrhea, dehydration, and vomiting. But high fever and severe abdominal pain is not that common. I mean, diarrhea can cause abdominal pain, but not this severe. We already said in our physical examination, when we were touching, just touching the patient's abdomen, he was uh, yelling. We could barely touch his abdomen. So gastroenteritis is usually not that severe. It can cause abdominal pain, but you can relatively examine him with, with, with ease. So yeah, uh, it does not explain the severe abdominal rigidity um, and the pain that the patient had. Okay, as the abdominal pain in gastroenteritis is mildly tender, if at all. The generalized and severe tenderness, because generalized we mean, like if you touch the periambulical area or any area around it he complains of pain so he has pain in almost all of the areas of the abdomen so this is what we mean when we say generalized uh, and severe tenderness with the rigidity in this patient this warrants further investigation for different diagnoses so this is why we should not uh, be quick to judge and, and say that it's gastroenteritis food poisoning is possible but usually it doesn't come with such a high fever vomiting is much more frequent as well more than diarrhea um, other family members did not have such uh, symptoms, so it makes it unlikely. However, it should still be in the differentials. FMF, I just talked about it, is common, and uh, at least in our region. Okay, so please be careful. FMF is common in the Mediterranean region, from the word of the, from the name of the disease, the Mediterranean region involving uh, Arabs, Armenians. Uh, Turks and non-Ashkenazi Jews okay so the area around the Mediterranean Sea it presents usually in the first two decades of life uh, around you know before the age of 20 usually but not always so please please pay attention to the words in medicine these are very uh, important when we say usually we mean usually we don't mean always always mean means always Almost always means a very large proportion, but not all. So, if any doctor, most of the time, usually, when any doctor says always, the vast majority of the time, he will usually be wrong. Okay, so, <laughs> even when I'm talking about this, I say usually. So, yeah, words in, me in medicine are very important. So, sometimes, yeah, it can present after 20 years old. So, anyways, it can mimic acute abdomen. It can mimic appendicitis and it can cause fever and tenderness but it does not explain vomiting vomiting usually doesn't happen uh, in FMF okay or the diarrhea either if you read in Medscape you will see it does not mention these two okay but sometimes we can have diarrhea after an FMF attack anyway FMF presented after the rest of the other differential we, we wrote it after that because it, its attacks are self-limiting so it's not as dangerous and it does not need, need uh, urgent management like the rest so what investigations now this is again a third step so the first one is having a history the second is having differentials and discussing them and the third is to make decisions what tests are you going to decide to order Again, this is an extra. This is, we said, you only need the history, but I'm only doing this because I want you to be interested and know that history is relevant. So you would know uh, that what you are learning to do is useful. So investigations, the primary ones, should aim to confirm or rule out the differential diagnoses, DDX. 
So that's uh, an abbreviation for differential diagnosis. So a, a complete blood count should be done to check for leukocytosis increase in white blood cells. Ultrasound is an acceptable uh, method to confirm to confirm the diagnosis of appendicitis. But a CT is needed for it for it to be uh, effectively ruled out because CT is more sensitive. Anyways, you will learn more about this inshallah in surgery. If the diagnosis is confirmed, appendectomy is indicated. Pyronephritis was investigated with a dipstick for leukocyte esterase and nitrites in addition to a urine culture. Urine analysis for white blood cells and casts. So we talked. These are all, you know, gastroenteritis is safe. Uh, FMF, I mean, you can read this on your own. I don't want to expand upon it because this will um, confuse you. But you can read it on your own. So anyways, these are the references. Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine. The Illustrated Textbook of Pediatrics. Um, I don't have it right now. It's over there. Okay. I talked about this in my videos on what to study and how to study different majors. How to study pediatrics, how to study internal medicine, how to study... Oh, I closed the YouTube channel. How to study um, surgery. There are videos that you can see and I talk about these references. McLeod's clinical examination and UpToDate and Medscape. These are excellent references. Um, so anyways, if you have continued until the last part of the video, <laughs> I mean, congratulations. I mean, uh, this is good job. I hope this was helpful to you. I hope that this taught you a little bit more about the history and why do you ask such questions and how do you form them and how do you report them and write them in your paper and how can those help you to um, to decide to make you know a diagnosis or not to diagnose something or rule it out and what investigations to order um, so yeah it can be over overwhelming at first but I hope you know this is a start and uh, yeah you always have to start somewhere so anyways thank you for watching and uh, yeah good luck in your course